Good day, this is Michael Taylor, continuing the lecture for History 365 at the University at Albany. And today we're going to be talking about warfare in the Dark Ages, warfare after the fall of Rome, at least the collapse of the Western Empire in 476 AD. Um, now, admittedly, uh, you know, if you go to a, a historian of late antiquity, the late Roman Empire, or the early Middle Ages, they don't really like the term Dark Ages. Uh, the term supposes that sort of the lights go out across Europe, that people just become illiterate. Um, and that's just not the case. There's still literacy, there's still economic exchanges, there's still uh, various political entities, um, although these entities are much more modest than, say, the might of the late Roman Empire at its 4th century AD peak. Um, but we're not necessarily living in a wasteland. Um, that being said, I think it is fair to say that the Western Roman Empire had brought a high degree of political um, stability, um, uh, economic prosperity, and also, I think importantly, a degree of legibility um, to human relationships that extended well beyond the frontiers. Um, so if you were living beyond the Rhine or even in Scandinavia, um, you nonetheless uh, know which chieftains and petty kings have diplomatic contacts with the Roman Empire. Um, you know those people who uh, maybe are engaged in the amber trade that goes down to Rome. Um, and uh, the fact that there are these connections with the political and military and economic power of Rome probably makes things somewhat more legible and therefore to a degree stable, even if you're living beyond the frontier. Um, we have quite recently discovered a very bit of grisly evidence for what uh, life after the fall of the Roman Empire looks like in Scandinavia. Um, and this comes from uh, a ring fort that has been excavated uh, in Sweden in a place called Sandy, sorry, Sandby Borg, um, S-A-N-D-B-Y Borg, B-O-R-G, like a cyborg. Um, so Sandy Borg, um, is a, is a, a ring fort, um, and uh, we know that the island that it's on, um, Orland, I, uh, uh, Sweden, um, was a place that had very significant connections to the Roman Empire, um, even in the 5th century AD. Um, and the evidence for these connections is actually a large number of, of the gold coins minted by the late Roman Empire, the, uh, the Solidi. Um, a solidus is a, a solid bit of gold. It's the predominant Roman coin after the 4th century AD. Um, and so even on this island in Sweden, well outside the, the sort of uh, frontier boundaries of the Roman Empire, although again, as I've tried to emphasize, for, for Rome, boundaries are always nebulous. The empire's political and diplomatic and economic power oftentimes uh, extends well beyond the Rhine and the Danube and Hadrian's Wall. And this is actually one example that the people living on this island clearly are uh, earning Roman money. And the, the most likely way that they're earning Roman money is serving in the Roman army, um, uh, uh, perhaps even uh, based on where some of these coins are minted, serving in the imperial bodyguard in Rome itself or in some of the other imperial capitals like Milan. So here you have an, uh, an island in Sweden that is uh, uh, very closely connected to the broader uh, imperial economy. Um, and then, of course, that comes to an end, um, uh, uh, probably comes to an end a little before 476. Um, and the fact that you now have this flow of not just gold, but again, also legibility. You may know that a local chief or a local king or a local warrior even um, has been in Roman service. His son is planning to go into Roman service. And in some ways, that's kind of lets you, lets you know just you know how your whole society is set up, um, and with the collapse of Roman power, um, that legibility quite likely goes away. Um, all we know is that sometime around 480, um, the residents of this ring fort in uh, uh, Sandy Borg um, were uh, annihilated. They were massacred, um, uh, and the uh, massacre is only beginning to be excavated by archaeologists. I think at this point they found uh, 14 bodies, but are likely to find more as they continue excavating. Um, the people seem to have basically been killed in their homes and then curiously left in their homes. Um, there is some evidence of attempts to humiliate the dead. Some of the dead had uh, the teeth of sheep or goats 
um, placed in their mouths, presumably post mortem. Um, uh, uh, again, p perhaps as a as a as a way of sort of a final humiliation. Um, and oddly, there seems to be no attempt to loot the ring fort. A significant uh, uh, valuables were found. It seems that animals were left pinned up and then died in their pens from from starvation. Um, and so, for whatever reason, people came into this ring fort, killed everybody, and then left. Um, the archaeologists speculate that rather than being foreign raiders, these may have actually been neighbors, a kind of neighboring community that intentionally wanted to simply annihilate the community um, and, and perhaps even uh, leave it as a kind of taboo spot um, uh, in the area. Um, so on one hand, you know, while I have stressed that you know, the fall of the Roman Empire it doesn't instantly turn the world into a wasteland, uh, it, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire does not, uh, you know, resemble the orcs trying to overrun Gondor. Um, in some places, um, the fall of the Roman Empire does lead to increased instability, increased violence, um, uh, and and also just again a lack of kind of political legibility, as uh, no one's really sure who's in charge, no one's really sure who uh, fits into sort of broader networks of political and economic and military power. Um, and the massacre at Sandy Borg um, is, is probably, I think, an example of that, of the, of the kind of violence um, and even chaos that emerges with the implosion of the Western Empire. Now, one piece of evidence that we have for warfare in the Dark Ages is, is the epic poem Beowulf. Um, this is a poem in Anglo-Saxon. Um, it was probably written down, that is, pen to paper, in the 10th century AD, in the court of the late Anglo-Saxon kings of Britain. Um, but it likely existed in an oral tradition um, uh, for several centuries. In fact, it may go all the way back to around the 6th century AD, um, the time when it appears to be set, uh, at least guessing from some of the genealogies in the poem. Um, now, Beowulf um, presents a picture where there are kingdoms, there are something state-like, um, but these are profoundly weak states. Um, the uh, king in the poem, the main king in the poem, is a guy named Hrothgar, um, and Hrothgar is not a very successful king. Well, he has a mighty hall, um, a mead hall, um, in which he distributes uh, mead and food and uh, treasure to his own warriors. Um, he is unable to stop a monster named Grendel um, from terrorizing his hall, and therefore he calls in outside help. Um, and his outside help comes in the form of a uh, hero, another war leader named Beowulf, um, uh, who comes from abroad. He's a geat. Um, he has a retinue of about uh, 12 other warriors, and this war band, uh, this retinue, um, led by, led heroically by, by Beowulf, um, does succeed in killing not only the Grendel, um, but also the Grendel's mother. Um, now, I think here the a kind of a, a takeaway, obviously this is a fictional story, um, is the importance of, uh, of retinues, of kind of private warfare to this period. Um, and indeed, uh, to the extent that there are states, to the extent that there are people who call themselves kings, uh, whether they call they go by the Latin rex or Anglo-Saxon kunig, um, um, they overall seem to be quite weak. And indeed, the only way that they have power is that they kind of sit upon a pyramid of uh, of networks, um, uh, so that. Uh, the king has sort of his, uh, you know, set of immediate followers, and he also has uh, uh, other war leaders who are dependent to him. Those dependents, in turn, have dependents and down the line. Um, but many of these kings uh, can be quite shockingly weak. Um, perhaps the weakest kings in the Dark Ages are in Ireland. Um, there's a period where there's roughly about 150 kings in Ireland. These are sometimes referred to as the midget kings of Ireland. Um, and in some ways, these are little more than kind of gang leaders. Um, uh, uh, there are even laws in Ireland that says a king um, will appear with no more than 12 warriors accompanying him. Um, uh, 12 is a, is a pretty modest revenue. Um, there are also laws in Ireland um, uh, that discuss what kind of payments you might have to make if you've given a king a black eye um, so that he's ashamed to show himself for a while. So they're called kings. 
suffice it to say, uh, they don't seem like particularly uh, strong or formidable figures. Uh, again, they're much more kind of like um, uh, the crew leaders of, say, uh, a neighborhood street gang. Um, uh, so uh, this is a world where oftentimes it's quite hard to, to tell the difference between warfare and just other forms of interpersonal violence. Um, and of course, as I said on the first day of this course, um, uh, you know, if you go to an anthropologist and, and say, oh, we're going to talk about violence, they'll say, look, violence is a spectrum that rages, ranges from uh, interpersonal violence, homicide, uh, and that spectrum goes all the way up to the mutually assured destruction of thermonuclear war. And don't try to necessarily draw a hard and fast line. Um, I've argued that at times we can draw a line, but for many, at many points of the Dark Ages, it's quite hard to draw that line. What are uh, two sort of sub-state war leaders either raiding or feuding? Um, uh, and what point does that sort of turn into warfare? Can be hard to, uh, to, to determine. Um, and indeed, one thing that our weak states oftentimes try to do is simply keep internal feuding from people below under control. These are, these are states that don't, that don't necessarily claim a monopoly on violence, um, but instead simply try to prevent the death spiral of blood feud. You killed somebody that matters to me, you know, I'm going to kill somebody that matters to you, and then this just back and forth continues. There's usually some attempt to, to put a stop on that. So for example, uh, the notion of vergil, the idea that, that if you uh, kill another man, rather than having a revenge murder, the state simply imposes a set fine that you can pay, and basically this clears the murder and stops the blood feud from damaging out of control and further damaging the society. Um, so uh, again, weak states, a lot of, uh, again, private warfare, people who are engaging in private raiding and private feuds. Um, and of course, weak states, at least in Western Europe, really do struggle to muster any kind of significant resources. Um, a king who can only appear in public with 12 people is not going to field a particularly large army. Um, and, and frankly, the armies, it seems, of even the other bigger and more established kings, say the Franks in France or the Visigoths in Spain and um, Aquitania, um, it seems even their resources are quite modest, um, oftentimes numbering no more than a few thousand warriors, even on a good day. Um, uh, so while there is a good deal of kind of violence in uh, Western Europe during the early Middle Ages, um, we still don't see structures that can really concentrate uh, that violence the way that we are accustomed to see, say, with the Roman Empire um, being able to muster uh, uh, field armies that in a number in the tens of thousands. Finally, I think it's worth talking about um, one really significant technological innovation um, that is arriving in Europe, uh, probably starting in the 6th century AD and becoming quite widespread, widespread by the um, 7th century AD, um, and that is the stirrup. Um, so we've been talking about cavalry for quite a long time, since it was probably invented by the Assyrians, who are the first to really start riding horses into battle. Um, but all this time, um, our cavalrymen have been without stirrups. Um, so they've simply been balancing on the horse, which does take a degree of uh, skill and training and verve to do. Um, uh, whereas stirrups um, uh, allow a rider to be much more stable because they can actually use the stirrups to shift their weight on the horse from side to side and also to brace themselves against the stirrups, say if they're holding a lance um, to uh, engage in a kind of shock charge. Um, so from the perspective of cavalry warfare, this is a pretty substantial innovation, although Military historians disagree on exactly how substantial it was. Um, there uh, is, again, a kind of old theory um, dating to the middle of the 20th century um, that the stirrup is profoundly revolutionary. Um, this here theory held that ancient cavalry, cavalry of the Greco-Roman world, had largely been uh, uh, ineffective simply because everyone was tottering on their horse trying to balance. 
Um, and that's why infantry in this period in the ancient world is the primary form because infantrymen are just stable. They can just stand there with their sword or spear while the cavalrymen are on their highly unstable platform. Um, so if that is your vision of ancient cavalry, then the invention of the stirrup changes everything. Um, and the argument is it was the invention of the stirrup that subsequently makes possible the predominance of cavalry in medieval warfare and um, also eventually gives us uh, the feudal system, um, an entire uh, system of land tenure um, that in, at the end of the day is based around um, providing a large cavalry force um, for medieval kings and rulers. Um, now, I, that theory in its strongest form I don't think is widely accepted anymore. Um, for one thing, uh, historical reenactment by skilled equestrians has shown that the technology of the ancient world, the, the, the saddles that we, as best we can reconstruct, um, we actually have some saddles that we found, say, uh, in, in bogs, um, allowed people to ride quite effectively, um, to control their horses um, uh, quite well, and also to do things like engage in shock charges. I mean, we do know that um, uh, ancient horsemen uh, carried long lances in which they tried to charge into the enemy, um, and, and we know that uh, they were perfectly capable of serving as heavy cavalry, like our cataphracts or clevenarii, um, uh, men in very, very heavy armor um, who are uh, uh, nonetheless able to, to remain balanced on their horse. So um, even though ancient cavalry is, I think, still considered quite effective, even without the stirrup, um, I would think that it is still hard to say that the stirrup has no effect. Um, I think without question, um, this does make it easier to ride a, a, a horse, um, uh, so it, it may to a degree also allow people who aren't as well trained um, to serve as cavalrymen, um, although obviously many medieval cavalrymen who spend their lives practice, uh, practicing their equestrian skills are profoundly expert riders. Um, and while we do know that ancient cavalrymen could indeed fight with lances and engage in shock charges, I would find it hard to argue that the stirrup doesn't make that kind of tactic all the more effective. So, um, well, again, the uh, exact transformation that this technology brings about, um, I think it is important to note that we do now have a new technology which has come in from Central Asia um, that does make it easier to ride a horse and does make it easier to fight on horseback. And I don't think that's going to be completely disconnected um, from the uh, emphasis on cavalry warfare that we're going to see going forward into the Middle Ages.